This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Turn your attention today to the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. St. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 down through verse 8. And I'm reading today from the message version of Scripture. Notice there these words. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said, There was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. A widow in that city kept after him. My rights are being violated. Protect me. And he never gave her the time of day. But after this went on and on, he said to himself, I care nothing what God thinks, and even less what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. And then the master said, Do you hear what that judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you, he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? And I want to talk today simply from the subject, finish it. Finish it. Finish it. Just finish it. It's so tempting to start something and not finish it. Jesus gave this parable to teach us to always pray and not quit. Finish what God ordains for you to finish. Finish what you start in him. Uh, it's interesting when the Son of Man, I want you to notice it talks about when the Son of Man returns to the earth, he'll be looking for people that have faith. He's not merely looking for people who have faith in him, but for people in whom he can have faith. Jesus wants to know, can I have faith in you? Are there any people on the earth who still have faith? Because to believe really means to never give up. So when Jesus returns, he's not just looking for people who have faith in him. He's looking for people in whom he can have faith. Because if he can't have faith in you, he can't depend on you to finish anything that he assigns to you. I want you to think about that. You see, when God knew that when Satan was going to buffet Job, God says, have you considered my servant Job, God says, I trust that boy. He's got character. Pull your best shot on him. Use whatever you got. It's something when God has faith in you. And when he can say, devil, unleash whatever you got. Give him your best shot. They'll never turn their back on me and curse me and die. Yes, yes. Even when you're having trouble. Even when negativity starts happening in your life. Even when you deal with depressing situations, God says, Give him your best shot. If God has faith in you, he says, listen, when, when the Son of Man returns, shall he find that kind of faith on the earth? God's looking for people that he can have faith in on the earth. But how many times have you left something unfinished, undone, because you got tired, because you became discouraged, because you got distracted, because you got bored, or because you felt unappreciated and you just give up on it. Let me tell you this. Desperate times call for, for desperate measures. The Bible says that this woman was a widow woman. Uh, now, you have to think about in the time of Jesus. If a woman became a widow, 
She was destined to poverty. She had no husband's pension that she could receive. She was not the benefactor of an insurance policy. So when her spouse died, who was her sole provider, she was destined to begging for the rest of her life. This woman had a motivation to be unrelenting on this unjust judge. And, and there are a lot of people that read this parable in Luke chapter 18 that Jesus gives us. And they assume that Jesus is saying that in the same way that this woman was unrelenting, she kept on going before the, this unjust judge. And they use the unjust judge as a type of God. God would never have made himself an image of an unjust judge because God is a just judge. And he's saying that if this woman was able to wear down a wicked, evil, corrupt, unjust judge who is really a type of Satan so that when the devil is riding your back, you got a woman, my God, he said that if a, if a woman who is destitute and she's destined to poverty because she has nobody to fight for her case. If this woman could assault the devil and said, say, you have to get off of my back. I need some help down here. I need help with these dishes. I need help with cleaning up around here. I need help with taking this trash out. I need help with my car note. I need help. And she wore the unjust judge out. Now this man was so wicked. He says, I have no respect for God and I don't care what people think. But he said, but this little woman is about to wear me out. She's sending emails every day. She's, she's mailed me snail mail. She done called my office every single day. This woman is about to wear me out. She done talked to other people on the council, other attorneys, other judges. She is wearing me out. She's unrelenting. And he says, even though I don't have any regard for God and I don't care what people think, if I don't do something to rectify this poor woman. See, this woman, when you're backed up by your circumstances where you don't have a choice. That I got bills coming in and I don't have any help. And I've been working all of my life and I served and I've paid my part and I've been left here destitute. This wasn't my fault. But somebody, somebody going to help me for real, for real. And she's in a bad situation and she's desperate. She's got to have some help from somewhere. And she goes to this unjust judge and wears him out with her continual coming. Here's the principle. Remember that if you are persistent, if you're persistent, you'll get it. If you are consistent, you'll keep it. And if you are grateful, you'll attract more of it. So they have a way of being able to do it. That if you're persistent, you'll get it. If you're consistent, you'll keep it. And if you're grateful, you'll attract even more of it. And so this is the way that we have to be in our hearts that we are going to be determined that we are going to stand in the gap. And we're going to fight for what God has given us because we are unrelenting when we know that something is destined to be a part of us. I love something that Albert Einstein said. He said, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. Can you imagine what you could work out in your life if you would stay with problems longer? If you would not be so easily discouraged by your first failure. You know the average business person has failed about seven times? I mean, you'd be surprised. And so sometimes if people, uh, they will count themselves out and say, you know what? Three strikes you out. Says who? A righteous man falls seven times and rises up again. It says a righteous. And you think that whoever told you that if you were righteous that you weren't supposed to have some mishaps. The righteous fall seven times, completely falls. But he gets back up. He's unrelenting because he realizes he has to finish it. She realizes she has to finish it. Finish it. You've got to finish what you start. You've got to finish the assignment that God gives to you. I want you to notice something in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42 in the message version. Jesus has given us another parable. He says, here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. 
If someone drags you into court and sues for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. Now Jesus is introducing some strange kind of teaching. Because see from the Old Testament, the law of Moses said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Somebody put your eye out, you put theirs out. They kill one of yours, you kill one of theirs. It's just eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. That's what the world does. That's carnal thinking. But Jesus came to teach us something differently. And he said that if somebody asks you to go a mile, he says go with them too. Now I want you to understand, you have to understand the context and time in which Jesus lived. By this time when Jesus had said this, uh, the Palestinians uh, had, had invaded uh, the, the Jewish territory here. And uh, they'd been there for a hundred years. They'd been there a hundred years. And they had a law here that a Roman soldier could command any uh, Jewish civilian to carry his weapons and his backpack for a mile. That they had a law. It was a Roman law that a Roman soldier could ask any civilian to carry his weapon and knapsack for a mile. So most of the Jewish young boys, they had marked off exactly where a mile was from their home. So that in case they were hanging around in the yard, then the guy said, come here, boy, carry this stuff. And they had to go with him a, a mile. He was determined that, that I'm just going to go because I know exactly where a mark. When I get to this big rock, that's my mile mark. And my job is done. But Jesus said, in a context like this, he says, I want you to realize if they ask you to go a mile, go with them too. Now that was crazy. But he says, go with them too. This is what I would call the principle of the miracle mile. Do more than is required. Do more than is required. Don't just do enough just to get hired and just to keep from getting fired. Do more than is required. Do more than is required. And so uh, the Pharisees had this kind of mentality of a minimum morality. A minimum morality. And, and, and they had this concept of what I would call a loveless legalism. This loveless legalism. But Jesus said, do more than the law requires. He said it in several different ways. He said, return good for evil. He said, love your enemies. He said, bless those who curse you. He said, do good to those who hate you. He said, pray for those who use and, and persecute you. That doesn't sound like eye for an eye and two for two for me. Jesus gave us a higher law, which is the law of love. And the higher law always trumps the lower law. Do more than the law requires. If somebody was just doing something just because they legally have to do it, that doesn't show love. That shows law. But it doesn't show love. But going the extra mile shows the way of love. Now, Jesus' instructions to us are simple, but they are not easy. Not everything that's simple is easy. And to fulfill the instructions here that Jesus gave us, let me tell you this, you got to be full of the Holy Ghost for real, for real. And you got to be baptized in love. And you have to have died to yourself. And you got to die a thousand deaths. You have to die to yourself and to what you want to do. Nobody trains and becomes excellent at what they do because it felt good. You got to press beyond the pain. You got to press beyond the pain. Because you don't grow, you don't start growing till you feel pain. You don't start growing until you feel pain. You got to feel the burn. You haven't done anything in the gym, you don't ever come out sore. You, you haven't done anything lifting weights until you, you start shaking. You got to lift until you... Do you feel this thing and then, then they're going to press you and say, give me, give me five more. And it's, it's when you get in that uncomfortable, that's the second mile, that's where you get your greatest benefit. If you stop right at the point of pain, you'll never grow. You can't stop at the place of pain. You've got to keep going. It's true in the gym. It's true in raising children. It's true in a marriage. It is true in a business deal. It's true in business in general. If you're going to grow, you know, growth has to be financed. Every time, if your business is growing, you, got a, you need a bigger place, you need to hire more people, it's more expense to you. 
Growth has to be financed. Every time your children grow, it has to be financed. It's not like you just bought them the shoes and hit it. And that toe nail was at the end. Because growth has to be financed. It means you got to get some more shoes. you got to get some more clothes. I just bought you a jacket. And you trying to tell me? And isn't it crazy when they grow out of stuff before it wears out? Anybody, any, any parents here that know what I'm talking about? So, that, there's a, we call that growing pain. Because every time they grow to another level, it costs you. It costs you. Growth costs you. And the reason that people don't want to grow is because they don't want to pay the price. And, and this is what the word, you know the word indolent? Say indolent. The word literally means this. Avoiding pain. Indolent means lazy. Lazy people avoid pain. They avoid pain. It's not that they don't want to do anything. It's just that they want to avoid anything that causes pain. They're too lazy to go to work, but they'll play video games all night. Oh, whoo! Because <laughs> see, video games give you pleasure. But the indolent person, the lazy person, avoids pain. You, you should always leave the comfort zone, but don't ever leave the growth zone. You keep growing. You have to be determined, I'm going to keep growing. And see, when Jesus said to walk the extra mile, he was not teaching Christians to be doormats. I don't want you to hear that in this passage, that he's saying, listen, if somebody asks you to go a mile, just go two miles with them. If they ask you for your shirt, give them your coat too. And he's not asking us to be doormats. Jesus is not doing that at all. Jesus is not te telling us to allow others to take personal advantage of us. But what he is teaching Jesus is teaching us not to take personal revenge. That's what this whole thing is about. Don't take personal revenge. Don't take personal revenge because worldly people call it karma. You've heard of karma? You've heard of the law of retribution? That you reap what you sow? You don't have to try to pay. God says, I've already got it built into it. When they did you wrong, it's coming back. What goes around comes around. He says, trust me, trust me, I got this. And God says, if you trust me to do the process, I can do it better. I'll fix them better than you could ever fix them. He said, trust me, trust me, I got this. Don't try to take vengeance into your own hands thinking that you can repay people and that they're not going to do you like that and that you're going to see, you're going to get the last word in. Just hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battle. Here's a beautiful thing. When you hold your peace, you keep your peace. Because you got to walk with the one who is the prince of peace that is holding you because Jesus is saying, stand back, my child. It is better for you to tie a millstone around your neck. A millstone is a 2,000 pound stone. He says it's better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and to cast yourself into the midst of the sea than to mess with one of these, my little ones. He said, that's my child. That's my baby there. Don't you put your hands on my child. Jesus said, I got your back, baby. Stand back here. Let the Lord fight your back. Victory, victory is mine, but the Lord is the one that fights your battle. He is the one that's got your back. And you let Big Daddy come in and fight for his children. God is a real God. He goes before you. He goes behind you. He's with you. He's in you. He's above you. He's under you. God said, I got you surrounded, baby. Walk with me. Trust me with everything that you got. Don't you try to fix them. Let God fix them. God has a way of being able to fix people. You'll see them years down the road, broken down, jacked up. I'm just telling you, you just, you don't want to mess with a child of God. God will fix them so badly that you will pray for them and you'll start feeling sorry for them. And like, Henry, is that you? You won't even recognize them. I'm just telling you, God has a way. If you trust them, if you trust them, if you trust them, if you, Helen, is that you? Let me give you 
be a scripture for this. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Look at it. Dear friends, never take revenge. How often? Never take revenge. Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture said, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Vengeance belongs to me, God says. I will repay, says the Lord. When God comes to repay somebody, you know what I'm just telling you, God's got it. Touch somebody, send them, remind them, God's got it. 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 I know they did your own. God's got it. I know they have some of your money back. God's got it. I know that they may fight for you and don't want to give you money for the children, but God's got it. God, touch somebody, tell them, God's got it. God's got it. Stay on your feet. They left you with nothing, but God's got it. God's got it. God's got it. That's my baby. That's my baby. Jesus is just telling us here, take the high road. Take the high road in whatever you do. Take the high road. I'm just telling you, the first mile is the slave mile because they made you by law do it. But he says, go the second mile. The first mile is the a, is a, is a slave mile. Uh, you, you know, and the, the second mile is the smile mile. Amen. See, they're, they're, they're different kind of miles. In the first mile, you're required to, to, to go that far and you are the victim. The first mile is the victim mile. And the second mile is the victor mile. It's saying, you didn't make me do this. I'm doing this out of love. And see, that confuses their mind. It discombobulates their thinking. They can't figure out. All that they had to do was to carry it one mile. They carry it now two miles. I'm not making them do this. Now, they, they enjoy this too much. And now they get confused. You see, the first mile makes you bitter. But the second mile makes you better. In the first mile, you are conquered through humiliation. But in the second mile, you conquer the thing that was trying to humiliate you by saying, I don't have to do it, but I'm doing it anyhow. The first mile is the law mile. The second mile is the love mile. The first mile is drudgery, but the second mile is victory. I'm just telling you, God always just takes a little extra. He just uses the little extra and then makes the ordinary extraordinary. That's what he does. God will always... Just use a little extra that makes the ordinary. Just a little extra put in front of the ordinary makes you extraordinary. And that's why he says, just go the extra, go the extra. Because it takes uncommon practice to get uncommon results. Uncommon practice to get uncommon results. Uncommon practice to get uncommon results. I remember I was ministering down in, in the South Georgia. A, a, a white pastor that I was speaking for. And he had a son that played basketball. And he told me, I said, where's your son? He said, my son is at basketball practice. He says, every single day, my son has three spots on the basketball court that are his sweet spot. And he says, he goes to the gym every single day, no matter how he feels. And he goes to the left side of the court and shoots 200 shots from that position. Comes to center court, 200 shots from that position. And comes to the right side and 200 shots from every day. And he said he knows that whenever he gets on the field when he's on the court and they get the ball into his hands and he gets into his position that he's already practiced and trained for he can turn his head and it's all nets because he's already done it 200 times every day on Monday on Tuesday, on Wednesday on Thursday, on Friday on Saturday, on Sunday, he was just every day of the week, 200, in three different positions. And he knew that if you get the ball in my hand and let me get into my sweet spot, my God, what will happen to you if you just get faithful and do a little extra, 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 in an ordinary place. It'll make you extraordinary and exceptional. That's all you have to do is find your sweet spot and practice so that if you ever get into that place, you know what to do. Every musician has a sweet spot key that they like to play in. I don't like F sharp, I like C. You know, and you gotta find what your sweet spot is. You gotta find your sweet spot. It's easy to pay the white keys in the black. You know, it's just, it's just easier. It's just easier. You, you go into B flat major. You know, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different, it's, you gotta work around some different things. Your fingers got to go up and down in a different way. But when you come in C major, 
It's a sweet spot. It's a sweet spot. I, you know, y'all don't know, but I played the keyboard for years. And I always played in C. I don't care what key people sang in, it was going to be in C. <laughs> I got so excited when I got a keyboard and I could bend it and change and transpose a key and play it. I could play in C and you'd be singing in E flat and you didn't know that I was still in C. C is my sweet spot. It's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing. But finish whatever God gives you. Matthew 24, 13 reminds us that he that endures to the end shall be saved. She that endures to the end shall be saved. It doesn't matter how you start, it matters how you finish, finish, finish. You got to finish it, finish it. You want to finish this thing and be able to hear the words, well done, well done. And see, here's the thing is that somebody psyched us out by telling us that in order to finish the journey, you got to enjoy the journey. There are heels on the journey. There are curves on the journey. There are hurdles on the journey. You don't enjoy leaping over hurdles, dealing with obstacles, but they are part of the journey. Some things are designed to be enjoyed. Others are designed to be endured. He that endures to the end, he's already telling you, you're not going to enjoy everything that happens on your journey, but endure it. Endure it. Endure it. You see that word? Endure it. You see the word endure? If I were you, I would write that down. I would type it down because you would write that word endure, E-N-D-U-R-E, -E, endure. Look at the first three letters, N. See the N from the beginning. The way that I'm able to endure it, if I endure it. You know, it's just like if you're living with somebody and you know some of your in-laws come and move in with you for a while. You know how you endure that? It's to say, I got 119 more days. And the next day, 118 days. You know, I mean, they say, I don't know whether this is true or not, but they say that in, after three days, both fish and guests start stinking. So when somebody comes, you count it down, see the end from the beginning. Just see the end. I know, I know your mom and them coming. They're they going to be with us for two weeks. Okay, we got ten more days. Nine more days. Seven more days, six more days. So the only way that you make it through if you can see an end to this thing. If you can see an end, I'm just telling you, if you can see the end, you can make it to the end. If I can see the finish line, if I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, if I can see my graduation time, if I can see the wedding date, if I can see the date of my diploma, if I can see it, my God, it gives me enduring power. I get motivated on the inside when I can see the end of it. When you get come around that curve and you can see the finish line and you got just one more semester, my God, my God, Jesus, if you just help me, God, to get through this, if you can, but I can see it. Boy, you get your second win. That's, I'm just telling you, there's something that doesn't happen until you get your, my God, when you see that you're almost there, when you're just two weeks away from promotion, my God, if I can get if, if you can get your retirement with full benefits, oh my God. See the end from the beginning. See the end from the beginning. And just realize yourself, no problem lasts forever. No problem lasts forever. No problem lasts forever. That helps you to endure. No problem lasts forever. What is it that you have started that you need to finish? What is it that you have started that you need to finish, that God assigned to you. I'm not just talking about something that you wanted to do. I'm talking about what you really feel is a part of your God purpose, a core in you. What is it that you have started that you need to finish? What is it? And just re realize this, that you're not merely an aspiring artist. You're an artist. Start creating. You're not a, an aspiring writer. You're a writer. Start writing. You're not an aspiring singer or an aspiring dancer. You're a singer. You're a dancer. Start singing. Start dancing. Here's the principle. You learn to do by doing. You learn to do by doing. You learn to do by doing. Just start doing it. Just start doing it. Everybody who is a virtuoso today was a beginner. They were a starter. You'll never become anything unless you are first a starter or at first an amateur, but you've got to get started and you learn to do by doing it. Take a look at this little meme. Just do it. Just 
do it. Don't quit, do it. Don't quit, do it. Don't quit, do it. Notice what's right locked into don't quit is do it. Don't quit, do it. I wish we had some young folks that know how to rap and set it to some good beats and could send the message of life and continuity. Don't quit, do it. Don't quit, do it. And say something that has some meaning. Don't you quit, just do it. Don't quit, do it. Oh, don't push me, don't push me. <laughs> don't quit, just do it, don't quit, just do it, don't quit, just do it, don't quit. Just do it, don't quit. Just do it, don't quit. Just do it, don't, 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 don't quit. Just do it, don't quit. Just do it, don't quit. Just do it, don't quit. Just do it. Yeah. Oh, don't you push me here. We'll have church up in here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Take your seat. Let's go a little deeper. <laughs> Here's where I tell people not to quit. Because quitting makes you weak. Quitting makes you weak. And then quitting becomes a habit. You know some people that just don't ever finish anything that they start because quitting becomes a habit. And then quitting never wins. See, quitters never win and winners never quit. And then quitting gives others an excuse to quit. You don't want to give your children an excuse to quit because you quit. And quitting reduces your confidence. Reduces your confidence. Reasons uh, why you shouldn't quit. Here, let me give you reasons not to quit. You already hurt. Get a reward from it. I mean, you already hurt. You already wounded. Your heart has already been broken. Get a reward from it. Profit from your pain. Turn your pain into power. Profit. Monetize it. You already hurt. Get a reward from it. Another reason not to quit. Someone believes in you. Amen. Someone believes in you. Someone believes in you. You know, Evander Holyfield, when he was fighting, he had a brother that had some issues, but his brother was always at every match that he had. And, uh, and Evander would be losing some of his, his fights, and he'd be in the middle of a round, and, and, and it would be losing. And he would hear a distinctive voice crying out over that whole crowd. It was his brother. He hear this voice hollering out, can't nobody beat my brother. And he'd be losing. But he'd hear this voice, can't nobody beat my brother. And something bristled up in his spine. And he found this intestinal fortitude. And he'd come out on top and win because somebody believed in him. And one day that, that brother got sick and died. And Evander fought, and he was listening for that voice that had encouraged him. Can't nobody beat my brother, but the voice had been silenced through death. And it was the first time he lost a fight. You got to have somebody who believes in you. Reason not to quit. Somebody believes in you. Here's another reason. Someone is dependent on you. You can't quit because you got children that you got to feed that you've got to educate, 
that you got to give a foundation for. Someone is dependent on you. Sometimes it's a mother that's dependent on you, a father that's dependent on you. You can't quit because somebody is dependent on you. It could be your siblings that are depending on you. Somebody is depending on you. Here's another reason not to quit. You'll get stronger. You will get stronger. Here's another reason not to quit. You'll get smarter. If you stay on the journey, you'll learn some things. You'll get smarter. Here's another thing. You'll build character. You will build character. Here's another reason. You'll grow from this. You'll grow from this. Don't just go through things. Grow through things. And here's another thing. Is that you'll become an inspiration to others. Once you don't quit, you'll become an inspiration to others. I'm glad that this woman in Luke 18 didn't quit. She's become an inspiration to everybody that has read her story. And I'm not telling you that you won't ever feel like quitting. You will feel like quitting. Anytime that God gives you something that's worth having, you will feel like quitting. You'll want to quit. And you will say sometime, you know what, I'm through with him. I ain't going back. That's it. That's the last time you're going to do me like that. And then we find ourselves back. But when you feel like quitting, take one at a time. Just take one at a time. One at a time. Just one at a time. Sometimes it's just one thought at a time. Sometimes it's just one activity at a time. Sometimes it's just, it's just one workout at a time. Like, Lord, get me through this workout. Just get me through this workout. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Sometimes you're trying to lose weight. It's one meal at a time. It's just one meal at a time. It's just one conversation at a time. Just one at a time. Just one at a time. Sometimes it's, it's just to say, God, get me through the next 10 minutes. Get me through the next hour. God, just help me to get through this shift. Just Jesus. Have you ever been at work and you just said, Lord, until it's time for me to get off. J Jesus, please, please. <laughs> Hold me, Jesus, so that I don't say something stupid and lose my job. Just, just get me through this shift. Just get me through. Because if this woman says another thing to me, Jesus, I'm about to lose it. Sometimes it's just getting through one day. Sometimes it's just getting through one night. Because if you're sick, and you're struggling to breathe and pain is racking your body. It's just that God help me. Help me to get through the night. Just one night just gets me through the night. When you feel like quitting, just take it one at a time. Just one at a time. Here's the second thing. Trust your trainer or coach the Holy Spirit. Trust your trainer, the coach, the Holy Spirit. Here's the next thing. Rest. Whenever you feel like quitting, just rest. Because rest will renew your perspective. There's sometimes you'll discover if you'll just go to bed when you're stressed out about the problems, the things that are making you want to quit. When you turn it over to the committee of sleep and let it work on it overnight, you'll be surprised how much better you feel the next day and your perspective is renewed simply because of rest. So whenever you feel like quitting, don't just quit right then, sleep on it. Give it over to the committee of sleep so that you're not making a rash decision out of tiredness. Rest. And then pace yourself. You feel like quitting? Pace yourself for the long haul. Life is not a sprint. Life is a marathon with hurdles and curves. You have to pace yourself for the journey. And when you realize that you're running a marathon, you, you reserve some of your energy until you get to the last mile of the road. You reserve it. So you have to pace yourself. Because if you start blazing out really, really fast while you're young, you'll burn up all of your resources and you'll, you'll wind up with burnout because you failed to pace yourself for the amount of distance that you have to go. And then remain faithful and consistent wherever you are. Because God promotes faithfulness. God promotes faithfulness. Remain faithful and consistent. Here's the formula. Practice plus daily improvement, plus time equals genius. Practice, plus daily improvement, plus time equals genius. Practice, like that 200 shots a day in three different positions, plus daily improvement, plus time equals genius. Equals genius. That's how we get it, little by little. Your genius will come by just practice, daily improvement, Give it time. Genius. But remain faithful and consistent. Then here's the thing that I would say. Celebrate. Celebrate the distance that you've already come. 
Don't wait until you get to the end of the journey to celebrate. Celebrate small victories. You're trying to lose 50 pounds, but if you lose 13, just celebrate those 13. Celebrate the distance that you have already gone. Celebrate past victories. Celebrate what you've already accomplished. And then listen for the cheers of your fans, your family, your friends, those, those significant people to you, the great cloud of witness, your grandmama that worked her fingers to the bone to help send you to school, who encouraged you, who loved you, who prayed for you. Just think about that. those other folks. Listen for the cheers of, of your fans. And then when you attempted to quit, think about why you started. Why did you start in the first place? Has, that, has your why changed? Think about why you started. Think about why you started. There's a poem that simply says, don't quit. It was written by John Greenleaf Whittier. He said that when things go wrong as they sometimes will, and when the road that you're trudging seems all uphill, and when funds are low and debts are high, and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is press pressing you in a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is strange with its twists and turns, and every one of us sometimes learn he says, and many a failure comes about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Because success is failure turned inside out. The silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell just how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worst that you must not quit. For all the sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. Finish what God has given you to do. Finish it in Jesus' name. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.